in his series of seven parables in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew is very elaborate in prolonging the first two parables. He even gives explanations for them out of Jesus' mouth so that we have what it means. The other five are shorter and more poignant in context. The parable of hidden treasures and the parable of the pearls consists of two sentences each. And in the first sentence of each parable is a familiar introductory phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. The main point in these parables, of course, is found in their second phrase. These parables occur only in Matthew's gospel in the form of a pair. Now whether or not they were said back to back as Matthew gives them to, the, to us, we don't know. It could be that Matthew chose, because of how similar they are, to place them topically and bring them together. And strictly speaking, their introductory sentences aren't quite balanced. In one, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. And in the other, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. But yet, instead of coming at them with our own Western analytical minds... We're going to look at them today, trying to grasp the basic meaning of these parables, as the disciples who first heard them would have grasped them. Our text this evening comes from Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had, and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Would you open with me this evening in a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you that your kingdom is of such value that it is worth more than anything we could ever imagine or anything that we could ever have. We ask that we would see it for what it is, for the importance that it has, that our minds would be on reaching others for you, on sharing that kingdom, that importance, that wonderful thing with those who don't know you, with those who have not met you, with those that have not obtained the kingdom. It's in Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. Now Jesus told, this, told the parable first of a man that finds a treasure hidden in the field. What does he do? He goes and he immediately sells everything he has in his joy. Sells everything he has and buys that field. Children oftentimes fantasize that in some field or some building or some barn, they are going to discover a treasure that has escaped everyone else. It's not just children that have that fantasy, is it, though? Why has the Discovery Channel show American Pickers become such a hit? Because they go looking around in barns and in buildings and just looking around outside and they find old things that nobody placed any value on that are worth quite a bit of money. Everybody wants to find that hidden treasure. And in our sophisticated society, many people would call that unrealistic. We think such things don't happen anymore. Yet from time to time, discoveries like this are still made. A shepherd boy near the Dead Sea found scrolls that were 2,000 years old. A diver off the coast of Florida located a sunken vessel that was from the 17th century. It was a Spanish ship filled with silver and gold. A farmer plowing his field in Suffolk, England struck a container that held beautiful silver dishes dating from Roman times. And in the parable, a treasure has been hidden in the field. Who put it there? How long ago? These are questions that we want to ask, but they're questions that we don't have an answer to. 
It can't be answered. But what we do know is that in ancient Palestine, a country that was frequently ravaged by war, this was not an uncommon method for people to hide their treasures. People would often hide their treasures in part of a field rather than in their house. In a house, thieves would be able to come in and find it and take it. In a field, the treasure would be much safer. But if the owner was killed during a war, he would carry the secrets with him to the grave. Thus, it wouldn't matter where he put his treasure and where he had hidden it. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells us a story about the master who gave some of his talents to, the ser to his servants. A talent being a measure of money. To one of those, he gave five talents. To another, he gave two talents. These two servants invested that money and multiplied their master's money. But a third servant was worried. He didn't want anything to happen with the money. He just wanted to keep it safe. So what did he do? He buried it in the ground. Over the years, the ground of Palestine has become a virtuous treasure hunt. A man in this parable finds such a treasure. He may have been a hired hand. He may have been a renter of the field. He may have been plowing the field or digging a ditch or planting a tree. We don't know, but whatever the case, in this parable as Jesus tells it, he finds a treasure. He hit something. It didn't seem like a rock. He finds a treasure. We're not told what the treasure was, but the man was filled with joy at finding such a wonderful treasure, finding such an amazing thing. And in those days it was not uncommon at all for a person who was plowing or digging to accidentally come upon such a treasure. So Jesus' parable was describing a situation to the hearers at the time that was completely and totally plausible. Something they would have understood. They may have known somebody or known of somebody that had come upon a treasure as they were plowing the ground. Now there's the concern that some people have with this parable. At first glance, the man of the parable seems to be dishonest. Some may say that, he, that the honest behavior would demand that this man tell the owner of the field about the treasure. And since it was on his property, it rightly belongs to him, doesn't it? Well, not necessarily. Jewish rabbinic law said, if a man finds scattered fruit or money, it belongs to the finder. So the people listening to this parable would not have perceived this man's actions as unethical at all. In fact, the man had right by law to what he had found. It's obvious that the treasure did not belong to the man who owned the field. If it did, he would have dug up the treasure before he sold the piece of ground. So really, the man who found this treasure was being extremely honest for the day and for what was generally accepted as law. He did more than he had to. He could have immediately taken the treasure and not even told the owner of the field, not bought the field. But he sells everything he has and he goes and he buys the field so that he can have this treasure. He didn't have to buy the field. He could have just taken the treasure. But he doesn't. In fact, he did not even use the treasure to provide him enough money to make the purchase. Instead, Scripture states that he liquidated everything he owned to come up with enough money. So this man didn't do anything unethical. People may have shaken their heads about the rashness of this man's decision, but he knew what he was doing. With his money, he would buy this field to get this treasure. But we need to be careful not to lose sight of the main point of the parable, which is this. A man found something of great value, and he sold everything he had to get it. He was excited about finding the treasure, then he was willing to do whatever he could, go to whatever lengths in order to purchase that treasure. With a few strokes of the proverbial brush, Matthew paints Jesus' parable 
of the pearl next. It says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. By itself, this story closely parallels that of the story of the found treasure. The same dedication is found in both parables. Each man must have the object of his desire, and it costs them everything they have. Both men literally sell all that they have in order to obtain the treasure or the pearl. And during the Old Testament times, pearls were apparently well, not well known. But by the first century Christian era, pearls had become a status symbol of wealthy people, much as they can be found today. Jesus told his audience in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. And Paul warned the women of his days to dress modestly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothing. When women wanted to portray their wealth, they put on pearls and they put them in their hair. When Roman emperors wanted to show how rich they were, he would dissolve pearls in vinegar and then drink them in his wine. In much the same way, that a flamboyant man today might go ahead and light a cigar using a hundred dollar bill. One of the Colombian drug lords, while on the run from U.S. troops to seeking to arrest him, was known for lighting campfires and staying warm by burning hundred dollar bills. A little bit flamboyant, isn't it? But yet this is exactly what the Roman emperors were doing to show how wealthy they were. In the time of Jesus and his apostles, pearls were in great demand. Merchants had to go to the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and even India in order to find them. Inferior pearls came from the Red Sea. The better ones came from the Persian Gulf off the coast of India. A merchant had to travel in search of bigger and better pearls. And the man portrayed by Jesus is a merchant looking for these fine pearls. He's looking for the greatest. This merchant was a man who would buy things at wholesale price and sell them at retail price. He was looking to make money. We don't know how far he had traveled, but on a given day, he finds one pearl of particularly great value. For him, this was the chance of a lifetime. He will not be satisfied until this pearl is his, until he has it. And he mulls it over, and he makes his calculations, evaluating his assets, and he decides to sell everything that he has in order to buy this one perfect pearl. We should note that this merchant doesn't go from one pearl fisher to the next in deliberate search of one outstanding pearl. As he's looking for the pearl, in the course of his normal business, he spots the finest pearl that he has ever seen. He is just going about his daily life, and he finds the most amazing pearl he has ever seen. He sells everything he owns to buy this one pearl. This pearl is especially appropriate when we're looking at the kingdom because it's the only gem that cannot be improved by man. Think about that with me for a moment. The way we take a pearl, when we first get a pearl, is as good as it is going to be. We as humans cannot cut it, shape it, polish it, or do anything else to make it much better. Think about a diamond with me for a moment. What happens when a diamond is pulled out of the mine? It's ugly. It's gross. It's something that nobody would ever want to show off. But yet a jeweler takes it and little bits at a time cuts it down and turns it into the beautiful gem that is worn on a finger, worn on a ring, worn on a necklace or on earrings. But a pearl is not like that. We don't improve on pearls. A pearl is perfect when it's found. It cannot be improved by cutting or by polishing. In fact, one cut from a human hand makes a pearl 
worthless. That makes this pearl an especially appropriate symbol for God's kingdom. Because there's nothing that we can do to make this pearl any better. There's nothing that we can do to make the kingdom of God any better. The kingdom is divine. It's designed by a perfect God from the beginning of eternity. And any attempt on our part to change it or try to improve on it robs its perfection. Like the man discovering the treasure, the merchant suddenly sees this pearl. And it's a now or never proposition for him. Sell everything and buy this or leave it go forever. The friends and acquaintances of the the two men in the parable must have shaken their heads at what they saw them doing when they saw them selling everything they own. Can you imagine what that feels like? I certainly can't. To immediately sell everything that you own, all of your possessions, your house, your vehicle, everything that you have put your life savings into. They must have been surprised when soon after they learned the possessions these men had gained. And they would have to respect them. These two individuals knew exactly what they were doing. The two men, however, did not speculate. There was risk that was involved in buying the field or in purchasing the pearl. The items bought would keep their value. But there was still risk. What they did was most sensible. They had stumbled upon these items in the normal course of their work. Unintentionally, they had found something wonderful and amazing. And to bypass them would have been foolish. And buying the field and the pearl, the men did not make a sacrifice, even though they sold everything that they had owned. There's a basic difference between a purchase and a sacrifice. A purchase is directed towards acquiring something, an object of equal or greater value, and the sacrifice, on the other hand, is giving when no reward is expected. And both of these men found treasures in the pearl merchant, paid the adjustable price. And the man who found the treasure in the field paid the full price the feet. They heard opportunity knock and they were ready to pay the price. They gave all they had in order to gain the one thing that they desired. What then do these parables teach us? Church fathers like Augustine identify the treasure and the pearl with Christ. A new covenant to Christ says exactly the same thing. A new convert, rather, to Christ says exactly the same thing. I have found the pearl. I have found the treasure. I have found Christ. This is what I've been looking for. This is what it has been. And it is worth more to me than anything I could ever imagine. It may seem like we did find Christ. But it's Christ who offers the treasure and the pearl to the people traveling along life's highway. The truth is that we as sinners cannot find Christ because we as sinners are stumbling, stubborn, and blind. In Romans we read, there is not one who is righteous. Not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. It is the Savior who seeks us. Hear His words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into them and supply them with all that they need. Some travelers in life are searching. Some are wandering. Suddenly they meet Jesus and encountering Him, they find a priceless treasure, a pearl of great price is offered. And 
question is, when we find that, the question is, when someone finds Jesus, are they willing to pay the price? Are they willing to give up everything that they have known in the past? Because that's what we're asking people to do. We're not asking people to become a moral person, a nice person. We're asking them to become a follower of Christ. To be willing to go the extra mile. To be willing when someone makes them walk one mile with them and carry their path to go a second. To be willing to literally give the shirt off of their back if needed. We're asking someone to stop being necessarily a moral person, if they are, or an immoral person. And we're asking them to give up everything that they have ever had in their life in order to follow Christ. In order to know the Savior. The question that is asked to people is, will you surrender all? to obtain such salvation. Would you close with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we ask that as we leave this place, we would reach out to those who don't know you. That we would be there, caring for people and loving people, so that they have the opportunity to meet you. In so doing, they would find that pearl of great price. That we would be the one that comes alongside of them while they are in the middle of their normal day and helps them to see the treasure that is hidden right under the surface. That we would be there guiding them so that they look in the right direction to see that pearl. To find you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. we close this evening, we'll be closing with I Surrender All, <clears throat> a fitting song when we talk about a pearl of great price, when we talk about the treasure in the field. They gave up and surrendered everything they had for Christ. And he calls us to do that same thing each and every day, to offer our lives as a sacrifice to him. That's something that we must do daily. This isn't a one-time thing and we give up and everything's okay. But it's about living for Christ. And I know at least for me, every morning that's a conscious decision that has to be refreshed anew. Would you please stand as we sing?